depend upon consistent definition and measurement of the true carbon content of products and processes. Companies are beginning to consider that, to consider the carbon and energy content of their products, sometimes in anticipation of regulation, sometimes for good business reasons. However, many of them do not or cannot measure carbon dioxide emissions in their global supply chains. Six, support for well-functioning energy markets. This includes transparency of fuel pricing and other energy generation costs, as well as mechanisms to secure financing for long-term strategic investments. Now, this latter is frequently a sticking point for developing countries, and sometimes developing ones, depending on what that source of energy is. Now, a comprehensive energy security formula in the end, must support continuing robust innovation, both in terms of technological advances, but also in business process innovation and in policy alternatives. Now, we must innovate the technologies that uncover and exploit new energy sources, improve their extraction, and allow more efficient and environmentally benign uses of them. We must innovate new technologies that conserve energy and protect the environment, and we must innovate the technologies that lead to alternative energy sources that are reliable, efficient, cost-effective, safe, as environmentally benign as possible, and sustainable. Innovation and investment in both existing and new technologies are important. The challenges are great, but they offer tremendous economic opportunities. For existing technologies, development in wind, solar, and nuclear are showing great potential. The New York Times has caused, called wind the new oil. New blade designs and innovative flexible composite materials have cut down times, resulting in energy costs of about eight cents per kilowatt hour, competitive with natural gas and even coal-fired power stations were they retrofitted for carbon capture and sequestration. Solar is another alternative where cost per kilowatt hour has fallen from 50 cents in 1995 to 20 cents in 2005 and is expected to decline further. Current systems utilize photovoltaic cells, helostatic mirror or lens systems for concentrating for steam-based electricity generation or an intriguing experimental combination of the two. Now, nuclear power, in principle, satisfies many of the optimum requirements for enhancing energy security with minimal carbon load. The complete cycle from resource extraction to waste disposal emits only about two to six grams of carbon equivalent per kilowatt hour, about the same as wind and solar if construction and component manufacturing are included and is about two orders of magnitude below coal, oil, and natural gas. Unlike small wind and solar facilities, nuclear can supply the stable large baseload capacity to support urban centers and to stabilize large electrical grids. In fact, when California had the uh, rolling blackouts, the plants that didn't trip offline were the nuclear plants, when the whole thing happened not just in California but the Northwest. Now, operating costs today are competitive because of improvements in safety and operational efficiency. Although nuclear power plants are capital intensive, they cost a lot to build. And importantly, they require a sophisticated regulatory infrastructure to ensure independent safety oversight. But accounting for all costs, nuclear power plants can produce electricity at a cost of between 4.9 and 5.7 cents roughly per kilowatt hour. But the Achilles heel is management and disposal of spent nuclear fuel. Resistant. And I think the question is open. Now the real excitement lies in the innovation of new technologies and the abundant economic opportunities they present. And I'll only present a few. But nano-engineered materials hold great potential to improve existing solar technologies and to provide climate responsive cladding for buildings. For example, you know, I'm the president, 
at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, scientists have created anti-reflective materials to enhance conventional solar systems, including creating the darkest, that is, most light-absorbent man-made material yet developed. Other Rensselaer researchers have added copper nanorods to the bottom of a metal vessel, increasing boiling efficiency by an order of magnitude, which could improve the heat transfer for solar power generation. Applied in tandem, they, these could boost the efficiency of large-scale solar power generation, you know, on a, a massive scale. Biofuels are yielding fascinating possibilities. Algae is being developed as a source of biofuel that both sequesters carbon dioxide as it grows and does not impinge upon food production. It grows rapidly into a high-yield biomass, producing high-grade lipids for refining into biofuel, yielding about 30 times more energy per acre than land-based crops. Moreover, it is possible to select an algae strain to generate particular carbon chains needed for jet fuel, for example. Now, there's a little wrinkle because I said it sequesters carbon. It doesn't convert. It sequesters carbon dioxide. It doesn't convert it quite. Now, Jatropha, you ever heard of Jatropha? Well, it is a deciduous drought-resistant perennial that grows quickly in marginal soil, producing seeds with a 37% oil content. The unrefined oil can be used directly as fuel and has been tested successfully in unmodified diesel engines. Unlike other vegetable oils from rapeseed or soya, jatropha oil is not edible. In fact, Indian railways are using a jatropha oil diesel mix in their diesel engines. On December 3rd, a couple of weeks from now, Boeing, I believe, and Air New Zealand will fly a jumbo jet, powered in part with a 50-50 mix of jet fuel and jatropha oil in one of its four engines. You know, they got to have defense in depth <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to demonstrate that jatropha biofuel is suitable for aviation use and is economical. Now, I talked about coal earlier, and coal is and will likely remain the most widely used energy source for a period, which is why cleaner coal technology is important. The National Energy Technology Laboratory, which is a U.S. Department of Energy lab, suggests that post-production, pre-production, and oxy-combustion, uh, I'm sorry, post-combustion, pre-combustion, and oxy-combustion can ca capture systems that are under development are expected to capture more than 90% of flue gas carbon dioxide and reduce costs by 45%. Why is this important? It turns out that the uh, stream from point sources that produce carbon dioxide is probably 20% really. It's hard to extract the carbon dioxide for sequestering, so this is important. And currently the cost of capture infrastructure are high and there is a concern for the efficacy and safety as well of long-term underground storage of carbon dioxide. And so this has led some to focus on closing the carbon cycle, either through chemical or biologically inspired processes. In the nuclear arena, work is proceeding on, uh, for instance, the high temperature gas cool reactor with long-lived graphite-clad fuel that is passively safe without the need for the uh, schedule of conventional refueling of today's operating power reactors. And other reactor designs are under study, as well as studies on new materials for critical nuclear components. Part of the investment in existing technologies must be renewal 